Good afternoon, everybody. Pigskin Pete here. Welcome to the new Helmet to Helmet show with my new guest host, David May. You, some of you may know this guy. He is a Tennessee Volunteers guy, and we figured uh, we're going to give you a little preview here of what's going on over on Fan Pride and what's going on with HowardsRock.net and, of course, VolunteerRoadShow.com because we have a lot of content over there, but we figure we'll put some some uh, a weekly show on here for everybody to listen to on on YouTube. Now, unfortunately, today we don't have video, so obviously you're looking at a uh, video screen with without our faces on there. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but in the coming weeks we will be ha- this will be an actual video, and you'll also be able to find it on um, I'm assuming iTunes and Spotify and those sort of places. So, without further ado, before we get into this uh, weekly conversation here, I want to go ahead and welcome and thank my friend David May for joining us. How you doing, David? Hey, man, I'm good. How are you doing? Hey, I'm amazing and fantastic, but you already knew that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to get this thing going, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Talk some top 25 college football with you, so I'm ready. Yeah, awesome. So what we've decided to do, uh, David and I, is sort of pick the most interesting games of the the coming week and, and, you know, talk a little bit about those teams and those matchups. And maybe if there's something interesting that happened on the previous Saturday, we will uh, rehash you know, something that happened last week. So we'll start with that, right? So last week we had two epic games, the two biggest games of the week. One of them was not meant to be the biggest game of the week, but it ended up being that way. And that was the massive upset uh, down there in Athens, Georgia, uh, where South Carolina went in there and went to, took Georgia to double overtime. And then, of course, uh, what's, the, what's the kid's name? Rodrigo Blankenship, right, the kicker for Georgia. That's it, it yeah. Yeah, he misses a short field goal in double overtime to give the Gamecocks the win down there between the hedges. Um, I don't know a whole lot to say about this game other than I'm not surprised. I know everyone else seems surprised because Georgia was such a big-time favorite and you know South Carolina was unranked and South Carolina has some bad losses this year. But uh, honestly, I never get too high on a team. I never get too low on a team. Uh, this happens. This happens every single week in college football where you see a team that has no business beating a team uh, actually doing that. And that's what we saw happen there. Now, what all that really does is shorten the lease for Georgia. They can't afford to lose another game now if they want to keep their playoff hopes alive. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't overreact to this too much. I think that, you know, in a way, this may end up being a good thing for Georgia. It may, you know, get them to play with a little bit a little bit more uh, fire in these coming weeks. So what do you think about it? Yeah, uh, I mean, one thing about that game surprised me, and it, it's it's not that South Carolina South Carolina won the game. It's South Carolina won that game with their third string quarterback in the game, man. I mean, Ryan Holinsky gets hurt, uh, DeCarry on Joiner comes in, and he he finishes that game off and, and wins that game in double overtime for uh, for the Gamecocks. So. I mean, it was a big, big win for Will Muschamp. Um, it, it seems like with Will Muschamp, he always um, has those games that he's not supposed to win, that he does come through and win. Uh, but he also has those games that, you know, he's supposed to win, but they lose. So, um, and, and you can say the th- same thing about uh, Kirby Smart. I mean, mm-hmm. Georgia, Georgia, he's starting off the same way Mark Rick did. And uh, he, he hasn't proved to be any any better than Mark Rick was. They they say that, you know, Mark Rick didn't make the get get a playoff win or make the national championship game, but I mean there was no playoff. So I guarantee you that if there was a playoff, Mark Rick would have won at least one game and been in the national championship one of those years, you know? So yeah. just I mean, looking back at it, like you said, is it a surprise? Not really, but I am surprised that that South Carolina third string quarterback came in and uh, and finished that out for him. It's it, that's big for him, man. Yeah, see, this is what it, what I say is because you know with, with the with Clemson having that close game against North Carolina a couple of weeks ago, uh, w- one of the reasons I think this is so funny is because Georgia fans they were coming you know barking out of the woodwork saying how they would beat Clemson on a neutral field without a problem and this and that, and then they go and lose to South Carolina, right? Yeah. But I mean, here's what the difference between Schools like Alabama and Clemson and Ohio State and teams like Georgia, who are very talented and they're recruiting in the top five for the past three years, right? Even in the top three, right. is that great teams win these kinds of games because everybody's going to get challenged by a lesser opponent at some point. It's always going to happen. 
You can't dominate everybody every game every year. It just, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, but, but Clemson finds a way to win those close games, right? Alabama finds a way to win those close games, like they've done with Georgia over the past couple of years. Right, yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's the difference between a good team and a great team. So Georgia's a very good team, uh, but, but they – you know, when they get their backs up against the wall, they've, they've proven uh, over the course of several years now to blow it. And a lot of it is not the uh, the player's fault. I mean, it's, I, there's plenty of blame to go around, I'm sure. But this is all coaching. And a lot of these are very bad in play, you know, in game coaching decisions that they're making and, and giving these games away, basically. So, I mean, how much lo- how much longer will this go on in Georgia? Um, I mean, you can't fire a guy who's winning the East uh, more times than he's losing it. You can't fire a guy who's made the college football playoff. And is winning 10 or 11 games a year, right? Or can you? Right. No, you can't. And I, I think the answer here is uh, you got to keep Kirby smart and you just got to see where it goes. I mean, you look at Clemson and Davo. I mean, it. how long yeah. did it take for them to win a national championship? Yeah, exactly. Bam, yeah. Bam, Bama's a little bit different with Nick Saban. He won it in the second year. But, um, you know, they, you know, after that, they did blow some games that they weren't supposed to lose. Uh so it, it, I think that comes with time and, and consistency in a program. You know, they did a really good job, and I'm not a Georgia fan by any means. Um, they did a really good job bringing in Kirby Smart and getting getting those, you know, recruiting classes in to uh, set themselves up for success. And I don't see it going anywhere. They're going to be back. And, I mean, j- just by SEC bias, they could still make the playoffs at the end of the year if they if they finish strong. So we'll see. Yeah. And uh, you, like you like you said, like you know, it took Dabo a long time to get things turned around. Now, I will say this though, I think that uh, Clemson's program at that time was in a little bit worse shape than Georgia's was. <laughs> oh, for sure, um, man, absolutely. Um, but I again, I, I what here's this is a perfect transition into the next game we're going to talk about because this is what I think that Kirby Smart needs to learn from somebody, and that somebody is Ed Orgeron because Ed Orgeron took over, you know, an archaic offense. Um, that, that less miles left behind. Right. And uh, he's gone through three offensive coordinators in three years. Cause he's trying to find that one that can give him that explosive offense like Alabama and Clemson and, and Ohio state. Right. And, and he, now he's got his, now he's got his offense. Now look at LSU. Um, so that's what uh, Kirby smart. He needs to, to take a little bit of advice from Ed Orgeron and do the same thing. He needs to find an offense. Yeah. I have a, I have a very good feeling. James Coley will not be the offense, offensive coordinator of Georgia next year. So yeah, I, uh, I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so I don't know, man. We'll see. Um, but but again, with LSU, um, I, I think the key there with LSU is Joe Burrow. So um, they finally got their quarterback, and and they've got a good offensive coordinator. And look what they're doing, you know. Yeah, they have better skilled players too. The problem in recruiting is it's hard to get a five star wide receiver to come to Georgia because they don't pass the ball. Um, and if they do pass the ball, it's a two yard pass. All right. So if you're looking, to, if you have aspirations of going in the NFL, you want to go to somewhere where you're going to catch a lot of balls. You're going to catch a lot of big balls. Mm-hmm. And um, George is not that place. So it's a trickle down effect. I mean, they got to change their entire philosophy to get the guys in there that can do it. And uh, I mean, they had the they had the uh, the name brand to do it. And they're obviously recruiting well at every other position. But I don't think there's a single starter on with maybe maybe one. I don't know. But most of the entire wide receiver core for Georgia could not start at any other school that's in the top five right now. Right. Yeah. So. And I, I, I'll, uh, I'll say one thing about that. Um, you know, I agree with you when you say that a, a five-star wide receiver is not going to go to a school that, you know, runs the ball, uh, all the time, but those elite coaches, man, they pull those guys in regardless. Look at Nick, Nick Saban, you know, but those kids just get, they, they fall in love with the, with the program and, and they they don't care uh, if you run the ball because um, Bama used to run the ball all the time, man, and they still had Julio Jones, you know, all these guys that came in and, uh, you know, made big plays a wide receiver for them. So I, I think it's more of a, you know, how good are you in recruiting? Yeah, 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 I, I could see that. Uh, so speaking of LSU, speaking of uh, Ed Orgeron and that high-flying offense, uh, they had their big game with Florida this last week down in, uh, in Tiger Stadium. I don't call it Death Valley. I call it Tiger Stadium because the real Death Valley is in Clemson, South Carolina. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, but anyway, but it was a great game, and LSU lived up to the hype. Um, their offense is 
Um, who, if, you know, if somebody would have asked you a year ago, exactly a year ago, back in mid-October of 2018, that six games after halfway through the regular season in 2019, that LSU would have the best offense in America, would you have believed it? No, absolutely not. No, me either. I mean, more better than Oklahoma, better than Ohio State, better than Clemson, better than Alabama. I mean, stat-wise, anyway. I mean, they're they're scoring more points. They're putting up more yards. I mean, uh, Joe Burrow's having a Heisman-type uh, year so far. So it's pretty amazing what just a change of philosophy and, you know, change in offensive coordinator can really do for, for an offense. So that's what we saw on uh, Saturday. Right, yeah. Steve Insminger has done a fantastic job with the offense, man. And I say I say it again. Um, you know, they're lucky that they that Joe Joe Burrow made the improvements that he did, man. Because I mean, just the difference that that kid has made in in one off season. Um, he's gone from being like, you know, bottom of the SEC quarterback in my opinion to the best quarterback in the SEC. And, and, you know, right now he's a Heisman favorite for, mm. for a lot of people. So mm. um, I, I don't know what it was. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Steve Insminger is a quarterback guru or or what it is. But, man, they turn things around quick down there. So Well, I think the uh, magic sauce there was hiring Joe Brady from the, from the Saints. They, they hired him as an analyst, and he's the one they brought in there to revamp the, uh, the passing game. So you see a lot of concepts they're using that has been been you know being used in the Saints offense over the past couple of seasons, and he probably won't be there long because he's such a hot commodity right now. Right. Um, he'll probably end up getting a, an offensive coordinator job. I mean, hell, he might get an offensive coordinator position at LSU if just to try to keep him there. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of speculation about what's going to happen with him. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But, and, you know, and uh, the, the criticism going into this game was LSU hadn't, you know, the same old thing. LSU hadn't played any good defenses this year. That's why they're putting up all this uh, big, these numbers and these and scoring all these touchdowns. Well, we saw them go up against, I'd say, one of the top five defenses in America with Florida, and they waxed them. So I think we can go ahead and say that LSU is a legit title contender at this point. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree on that. Yeah. All right, so. Uh, you know, Clemson spe- uh, beat up on Louisville, uh, Alabama beat up on uh, Texas A&M, right? So, you know, uh, Ohio State had an off week, I think. So that was the top, you know, the top five teams or whatever, uh, top five games last week. But um, so this week we have the overrated Jim Harbaugh's traveling to Penn State, Happy Valley, to play in the whiteout, which is one of the most exciting and visually stunning uh, places to, to see a game on TV, whether you're there or on TV in college football every year when they have that whiteout at Penn State. Uh, I, I'm actually a little bit surprised that, you know, because Penn State looks really good this year, and Michigan is sort of like a roller coaster. They're up one week, they're down one week, they're up one week. Right. I mean, the Michigan fans right now are all saying that they, they think that they are finally got things on track. Well, I don't believe it until I see it. I've been sold right. that I've been sold that bag of goods, a bag of lies, even for the past couple of seasons. So I'm what, I'm at the point with them now where I'm I don't believe anything until I see it. So I was actually surprised to see that Michigan. It yeah, of course they're an underdog on the road, but but it's only seven and a half points. And uh, I would have thought it would have been more. I think Penn State's going to win this game uh, pretty handily. I'd say by maybe three touchdowns. So how do you feel about it? This is a hard one to pick for me. Um, James Franklin, it seems like he blows one big game every year, and uh, I mean, it, it, like you said, it's it's the wideout, it's a big rivalry game. Um, I, I'm with you on the Jim Harbaugh take; he's completely just overrated. I don't think he's going to be there next year. Um, so, I, I'd probably say that this game is is a lot closer than than people think, and I, I'd t- probably take the under on seven and and. Uh, you know, I could I could honestly see Michigan winning this game. Mm. Now, that's a hot take there. Yeah. Um, you know, again, anything can happen in college football. We see it every week. So would I be surprised? No. But uh, I'll tell you what. I don't know. I, I think I might, if I could scrounge up some of my son's money out of his piggy bank, I might put some money on that game and just bet on Penn State. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but, yeah, I, I – the other thing you said there is you you, you think that, uh, you know, if Michigan kind of craps the bed this year, you think Jim Harbaugh won't be there next year. Uh, I actually disagree. I think he'll be there for at least one more year, even if they're bad this year, because I don't know. For some reason, the fans for Michigan, they really love him, you know, despite the you know fact that he's 
five years in now and, and doesn't really have that good of a record, especially against highly ranked teams or teams in his own division, nonetheless. Mm-hmm. But um, I, first of all, I think his buyout is probably a little bit too high for them to justify. And second of all, for some reason, they, they, did, they love him. And uh, I don't know. It's sort of like, I don't know, uh, maybe like Les Miles stayed a couple years too long before they fired him. And I think you might see the end up, same thing end up happening with uh, Harbaugh. You could. You never know. But, man, he he's screwing things up up there, man. I mean, you look at recruiting. Tennessee's beating, beating Michigan out for players. And, I mean – and not just one player. We've we've taken three players from from Michigan this past year. So um, the recruits see it. Uh, the recruits' parents see it. Um, so it, it's more than just the fans. And, and you got to think, man, that athletic athletic director up there, he's looking for his job too. So you know, looking out for himself there. So I mean, it, like he loses one more game, yeah, he'll probably be there next year, but. He drops two or three more, man. I think you could see a new head, head coach up at Michigan. Yeah, I actually was talking to, uh, about this with a friend the other day, and we were we were kind of going back and forth. And I said, you know what? He, I think he might actually end up be more likely to leave Michigan to go back to the NFL than than him get fired, which is another possibility. Yeah, that that's a good point. They, you know, yeah. it could be it could be a mutual parting of ways there. And yeah. uh, you know, if if somebody offers him a job in the NFL. You know, it, it, I'm I'm sure he would probably take it to get himself out of that situation and to and to save his name. So yeah, if he goes on to somehow you know put together an eight or nine win season this year, that'll be enough just enough to keep him around for another year or two. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Just a weird, just a weird dude, man. I, I, yeah, he's definitely a weird dude. He creeps me out. Yeah, he's a weird guy for sure. <clears throat> All right, so next on the list we have. No, I think this is an interesting game for a couple of reasons. I mean, Vanderbilt is. They're really bad. I mean, they're they've had a couple of pretty good seasons, you know, for Vanderbilt standards over the past couple of years. They're just really bad this year. I mean, they're, they're losing to everybody. Not, I mean, not, not just normal Vandy standards. They're losing to you know non-power five teams, and it's just a mess. Uh, Missouri, on the other hand, is a twenty-one and a half point favorite in this game against Vanderbilt. Now, of course. Vander, uh, Missouri's sort of flying under the radar. They're not getting a whole lot of national attention because of that first week one game they lost to Wyoming, which is kind of a he- head scratcher. But since then, they've been really good. Kelly Bryant's playing really good. Their defense, I, I, I heard today on the radio, I had to rewind it and listen to it again. In, in total defensive statistics, Missouri is number one in the entire SEC. Yeah. In total, in total defense. Uh, so that's that's. I mean, their their offense is clicking right now. Their defense is playing lights out. They're really a tough out for anybody that they play. Ha- uh, Tennessee hasn't played them yet, have they? Or have they? Tennessee hasn't played Missouri yet. Yeah, I'm asking. No, no, they have not. Okay, I didn't think so. Um, so, so yeah, so right now, I mean, they're undefeated in the in the SEC. You know, as far as their conference record, their only loss is a head scratcher. You know, week one, and. Um, now, I mean, when's the last time you saw Missouri be a 21-and-a-half point favorite against anybody in the SEC? Right. Uh, that's I mean, pretty- hey, man, Missouri's leading the SEC East right now. So <laughs> they're on top right now. So yeah, yeah. this game's not going to be close. Um, I, I, I'm taking Missouri by at least, I don't know, four or five touchdowns. Um, Vandy, and I'm not just saying this because I hate Vandy, which I do. But Vandy, I, you know, I think they're one of the worst, if not the worst, Power Five team in the country right now. Um, mm. Just the way they got embarrassed at home by UNLV, man, thirty-four to ten, and, and it didn't look that close. <laughs> I mean, Derek Mason's on his way out. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no saving his job. Yeah, uh, I think maybe if he beats Tennessee, he might get another year, but. Um, and I'm not being biased by saying this, but I just don't think I don't think Vandy's got Tennessee's number this year. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Tennessee will win. But uh, so before the season started, I picked Missouri. I did a preview video for Missouri season, and uh, I picked Missouri after eight weeks to be eight and zero, which I, I looked like a real idiot after week one when they lost to Wyoming. But since then, I'm starting to look better now. So there's a yeah. real good chance. I mean, they have, you know, they always hear about the tough schedules in the in the SEC. They they had one of the easier schedules in the in the SEC this year because out of the West they drew I think it was Arkansas and Ole Miss who are both you know down right now 
So, yeah. So they, they have a very manageable schedule. I mean, obviously, no no game in the – you know, they still have to play Florida, who's good. They still have to play Georgia, who's good. Uh, like you said, um, I mean, Tennessee could give them a hard time, I think, too. But um, outside of Florida and Georgia, Missouri is probably going to be favored in every game they play this year, which is pretty unbelievable. So right. I think you're right. I think that they'll um, – I think they'll win by four touchdowns. I agree with you. Yep. It's, uh, you know, the key to Missouri season is, is Kelly Bryant has to stay healthy. Uh, you know, their defense is playing well enough to cover up some things, but if Kelly Bryant gets hurt again, cause you know, he had his concussion issue or whatever it was a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, if he gets hurt again, they're going to start dropping games and, and they're going to be done for the season. So. Yeah, yeah, they definitely need him to stay upright and healthy, for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, so on to the next one. This one, this is close to your heart, David, because this is the yearly matchup, the yearly cross-divisional rivalry between your Tennessee Volunteers, who are on a, what, a two-game win streak? Or they just... No, just one game, but okay, I'll well, take it. Yeah, whatever. Hey, they're on a, they, they won a game against a team they put, that they were <laughs> to, lose, to lose to. <laughs> Uh, oh, and, of course, man. you're going up against the juggernaut of Alabama. Alabama has uh, absolutely destroyed Tennessee the past two seasons. Uh, Tennessee is a 34-and-a-half-point underdog right now. And, I mean, I'm going to say this. Yes, Alabama's going to win this game. I mean, yeah. It, I mean, I, everybody knows it. Everybody in Tennessee knows it. Everybody in Alabama knows it. And pretty much everybody else that watches college football around the country knows it. But – I'll give you this much. I think Tennessee will go out there and fight and keep it close, at least manageable for the entire first half, and that that they'll lose by less than 34 and a half points. Man, uh, that's a that's a hot take by you because I think this game's going to be something around the area of like 56 to six. Uh, this isn't going to be close. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they have a little momentum after Mississippi State, but Mississippi State is a really bad team, and Tennessee showed that. I mean, they they, they won the game last week by running the ball the whole third and fourth quarter pretty much. So um, it, it depends on is Brian Maurer going to play. That's the question right now. Uh, Jarrett Garantano did a good job managing the the end of that Mississippi State game, and he took care of business. But but he's not gonna he's not gonna give us a close game against Alabama. We're gonna need some momentum from freshmen from Brian Maurer to come in and to at least keep it respectable against Alabama. But you know we can skip over this game because it's gonna be ugly. It's it's gonna get ugly ugly fast. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just don't see any way that that the Vols keep this close. All right, so I don't know, man. I think maybe, you know, a turnover, too, here. You know, with Plukey plays in the first half. Tennessee builds a little bit of momentum. Now, I think that no matter what happens, Jerry, I still, Jeremy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see less than a 30-point loss. I mean, I think 34-and-a-half is right, right, probably right about right. It's but. a 9 o'clock game in Alabama. They're going to have their new LED lights or whatever going on. It's going to be loud. Yeah. And they're gonna they're gonna beat the hell out of us. And <laughs> I mean, Jeremy Pruitt said it today. He he was asked about um, I don't know what the the question was, but something about uh, what's your game plan. And he he brought up the coach in Arkansas that doesn't uh, punt the ball. He onside kicks yeah, every yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeremy Pruitt's like, yeah, maybe we should give that a try. Maybe we'll have a chance then. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Tua and those receivers, you know, Jerry, Judy, Ruggs, all those guys, man, they're just, they can be NFL teams, like <laughs> NFL defenses, you know? So uh, they're just too, they're too good. We're not, it's going to be a bad game. Yeah. All right. Well, you, you, you're starting to talk me out of it now. Uh, so I don't know. I thought, I thought Tennessee would at least, you know, keep it respectable, but you're saying it's going to be, would you, would you say 52 to six? <laughs> I, I, no, 56 to 6. Oh, 56 to 6. All right. Yeah, All don't right. give them too much credit. Man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll move that past that one. Um, now, this game is only reason – Georgia and Kentucky, this game I think is in Athens. And uh, the only reason I think this is interesting is because Georgia's coming off of that loss, and we just – you know, we spoke in depth about, you know, not overreacting to that loss if you're Georgia too much, but you do need to fix some things, obviously. But listen, Kentucky's not the Kentucky of last year, right? They don't have right. Josh. They don't have Josh Allen or whatever his name was. They don't have Benny Snell anymore. Those guys are off to the NFL. Right. And so, Kentucky, it, it right along, you know, with a couple of other teams 
and the SEC have sort of taken this is a down year for them. And mm-hmm. I think Georgia's going to come out mad. They're going to come out. They, they've been disrespected. They've been, you know, reading the uh, the newspapers and the uh, and Twitter and Facebook and seeing how everyone says how they suck. And a lot like Clemson did to Florida State, I think that's what you're going to see Georgia do to Kentucky. Georgia's going to beat the living hell hell out of Kentucky, man. It's not going to be close again. Kentucky's got a wide receiver at quarterback right now in Lynn Bowden Jr. Their first string, second string, and third string quarterbacks are all hurt. So they're playing Lynn Bowden at quarterback right now. And, yeah, he he had, I think, three touchdowns um, last week and and a lot of running yards. But you got to be able to throw the ball against Georgia to beat Georgia. You can't beat them by playing their style and running the ball the whole game. That's not going to happen. Their defense is too good. Um, I'm going to put this game somewhere around uh, 42-14 Georgia, something like that. Um, I just don't see it being close at all. Okay, so the spread as of right now, or last time I checked it anyway, it was 24 and a half. So when you said 42 to 14, what is that? 32. All right, so you think they'll cover that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Georgia covers. Okay. Um, I agree. I actually, I actually feel like that Georgia is going to not only beat Kentucky, but they're, they're going to destroy them, like you said. I think it's going to be way over the spread. Uh, I'd say that they might score 45 to 7 or 10. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and this is listen, this is a huge game for for Georgia to to rebound because if they go out there and they struggle against Kentucky, you know, if they're if they're even if even if they let Kentucky hang around for the first half, it's right. uh, it's gonna kill their confidence coming off of a loss. And uh, that this is a pivotal game for them, even though it's against a bad team. They need to go out there and dominate just so they can get back on track. So right, we'll yeah. You you let you let Tennessee hang around the first half of the game. Um, you you let South Carolina hang around in the first half of the game, and then they beat you. If you let this happen against Kentucky, man, that's going to kill the confidence. It could kill the confidence for the rest of the season. So they have to be really careful. They got They got to get out there and they got to start strong. James Coley has to open up that playbook or call Jim Chaney and get and get his playbook again because. <laughs> <laughs> This game is really important for Georgia. Yeah, man, that's kind of weird. They downgraded that OC, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, I, all, all the Georgia fans didn't think so. They thought, you know, hey, take Jim Cheney. He's terrible. You know, all he all he wants to do is is run the ball. But I don't know. Yeah, it's working pretty good for us, I guess. You know, or whatever. <clears throat> all right, so moving on to the next game. This is uh, one of the hottest teams in the country until last week, the Florida Gators, against. The hottest team in the country for at least one week out of every year, the South Carolina Gamecocks. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know what? I, I didn't even write down these. I don't know what the spread is. But I know that Florida's favored. But I would imagine after last week that uh, it, South Carolina is probably not as much of an underdog as they sh- really should be. And, um, you know, this game is actually tricky, right? Because – Florida has spent the entire first five weeks of the season up until last week really looking ahead to that LSU game because that was the biggest game that they've had up until now. And they went in there and they got their, their, their rear ends handed to them on the road. It's probably a very emotional, emotionally draining week for them. Um, and, then, and then on the other hand, you have South Carolina who's coming off a very emotional high of beating, going into Athens and beating Georgia. So you had the two polar opposites of attitude here between these two teams within a one-week period. So right. this is a this is a dangerous game for Florida, I think, because at this point, Florida has everything to lose, right? And mm-hmm. South South Carolina doesn't have anything to lose. They're sort of like that guy at the bar who's you know his dog died, his wife left him, and he lost his job all in the same day. He's got nothing to lose. He'll fight anybody and probably yeah, kick his ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know it's a dangerous game. Now I listen. Having said that, I think that w- we may see the universe correct itself a little bit here. All right, I think that Florida's defense is just too much for South Carolina's uh, offense to handle. And I don't even really know, maybe you know, it, the condition of um, Holinsky. Have you heard anything about him? Uh, I think he had a sprain, and he should be good to go this weekend, I think. I, I'm not sure on that, but I'll check here in a minute. Um, like you said, man, um, this game 
it, it could go either way. And if South Carolina goes out there and beats Florida right after beating Georgia, and then they come to Neyland Stadium and play Tennessee, I'm going to be scared to death because we need to beat South Carolina for our bowl, for our bowl hopes to stay alive. So um, I just don't see South Carolina winning the same. I think the Gators get back on track. Uh, Kyle Trask is – a better quarterback than Ryan Holinsky is. Um, I don't know what Dan Mullen was thinking by by starting Franks at the beginning of this year, because um, mm-hmm. Kyle Kyle Trask has shown to be, you know, one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC just in the last couple weeks. And um, I mean, they kept it close against LSU for most of that game. Um, I've got Florida winning this game. I've probably probably by two touchdowns. Right. Uh, I think that's a fair thing. I, I wish I would have wrote down the spread for that one, but I feel like uh, I, I feel the same way. So, I mean, imagine the chaos that would ensue in in the East with Georgia losing, and then if Florida lost, you know, last week, and then they somehow lost to South Carolina. I mean, you'd have Missouri and South Carolina would would be leading the the East, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be. It'd be. Uh... Missouri and South Carolina. God, this, they're already so delusional. I, I was on Twitter today, and they win one game, and they already – literally one guy was saying, you know, if we win out and we beat Clemson and we win the SEC, we can make it to the playoffs even with yeah. two losses. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, one one win, and all of a sudden they're making the playoffs. Right. Uh, unbelievable. Um, but, yeah, I agree, though. I, I think Florida is just – they're just that much better. And um, I, I'd say 17 points is – what I feel comfortable with 17 to 21 points, something like that. Yeah. All right. So I guess that'll wrap things up for this week, guys. Uh, again, we really apologize for the technical difficulties. We will have video up next week for the, uh, the second episode of helmet to helmet, uh, with Pete and David. Now, is, do you have any final thoughts, uh, criticisms, or maybe just want to say, you know, screw Alabama's, whatever you want to say, this is your time to oh, say it. always, man. Screw Alabama. (laughs) This is, this has been fun, man. And uh, I appreciate you doing this with me and I look forward to, uh, to see where this thing goes. So um, yeah, go balls. Yeah. Everybody go check out, make sure you go check out howardsrock.net. Make sure you go check out volunteerroadshow.com. If you want to get similar content to this, we do all kinds of uh, podcasts and videos over on those sites. Uh, And we're this, this thing that me and David are doing for you here, this is sort of a preview to what you get over there. So if you like this, which I know you will, make sure you go and become a premium member over there and you'll get all the football talk you can handle, especially if you're either a Clemson Tiger fan or a volunteer fan. Uh, So thank you, David. I'll see you again next week, buddy. It's been a great show. Absolutely, man. Have a good night.